Hey everybody. Um, I just want to spend a few minutes here talking a little bit about chapter eight. Um, I decided not to do a PowerPoint. Um, I was a little crunched for time, but also um, you're probably tired of those by now. So um, I'm going to try to follow the book um, as I go through this. Certainly you want to read the material. I'm not going to read the book to you. You can read. But uh, I just want to talk about a few of the highlights in uh, the text on performance appraisals. Um, when I was reading this and, and um, uh, getting prepared for this, I thought about all the performance appraisals I've had over the years, and I don't know that any of them have um, really stood out to me, because I think sometimes it is a... Um, Man, it's it's a it's a it's a habit. It's just kind of a one of those things we just do and don't really think about the implications behind it. So um, hopefully, this will help you be a better evaluator of your personnel, but also um, contribute more in your own evaluation process. I don't believe that evaluation should or performance appraisals, as they call them. Uh, it should just happen once a year. I think that it should be an ongoing process that happens uh, throughout the whole year so that uh, you can improve your performance. I've often said that no one's performance appraisal ratings should be a surprise to them, uh, meaning that you should not have to wait a whole year um, to know how you're doing, that it should be something that is ongoing. It also takes some work on the part of the supervisor or manager to make sure and, and make notes and keep files on people throughout the year. Um, sometimes we start off real good with that and then we fall by the wayside. So um, as we look at this particular chapter, and I'm looking at my notes here, um, describe the need for performance appraisal systems, uh, what are some of the techniques, some, what are some of the errors, uh, understand the elements of the system, how to prepare for the performance review meeting, how to conduct the performance review, and then describe a 360 degree feedback or evaluation, uh, which we've talked about in one of our other classes. So performance appraisal is simply nothing more than a formal assessment, a systematic assessment of how well employees are performing. Um, and it should be related to um, existing and established standards. Employees should know what those standards are, and then they're evaluated against those same standards. Um, communication is the communication of that assessment to the employee, uh, as well as the organization. And um, certainly it is a process. The process is to improve the quality of work, and thereby improving the quality of the organization. When an individual's work uh, increases or the quality of their work increases, then certainly um, the performance of the organization is going to increase as a whole. So um, we, it ha we have to make sure that it's comprehensive. We have to make sure it's fair. Uh, and that's one of the things that has always been kind of an issue with um, evaluations or appraisals in that they can be rather subjective at times. Um, so when we look at the need for a performance appraisal system, um, of course, performance is simply the you know what employees do on a daily basis as compared to that standard. Um, the appraisal should bring out strengths and weaknesses of that employee uh, based on that standard. And of course, the appraisal period, which is usually a year, it may be shorter than that, if, especially if it's the case of a promotion or a new recruit might be shorter. But it's the length of time that an, an employee's job performance is observed. And I think that's one of the things that makes it hard is that once we do that performance appraisal, we're starting over. And many times as people, where we may remember those things that happened two or three years ago, um, but that should not be considered in that appraisal process. Um, so when we look at the, uh, the need for that performance appraisal, um, uh, there's several things that are listed on page 204 in your book um, that, that management has to support that appraisal system. We can't just pencil with it. Management has to support that. Um, it should be designed to fit the specific 
requirements of the organization. Many times, um, jurisdictions will have one set evaluation instrument and or appraisal instrument. And sometimes it doesn't fit. What we do in emergency services may not fit into that system. So um, we have to kind of look at that a little bit. Um, some other things that has to be, here we go with these words again, valid and reliable. And it needs to be as objective as possible. And sometimes that gets a little hard. Uh, free of bias and discriminatory uh, practices. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. It should include a review or an appeals process. It should be documented. And, and the last thing that the book brings out in several places is that supervisors and managers should be trained in the evaluation process. And I think that that's important. I think that that's one of the things that makes it uniform. Um, when we start talking about the uniformity and everybody being graded the same, is that we have to make sure that that managers are trained in the same way, in the same process. So um, feedback and participation, most employees want to know how well they're doing or how well they're not doing, where they can improve. Uh, most people want to be that good employee. Um, it, it's also a time for personal development. What you and your employee can set goals for the upcoming appraisal period, um, personal goals for the employee that they may want to achieve, and you may have goals for that individual as well. Sometimes that's a little hard, um, but you want to make sure that that there's something concrete that comes out of that appraisal process so that when the, ne the next appraisal period has run, you can, um, you'll have something to grade and something, as, as we say, um, that's very objective and not so subjective. So lots of different reasons, lots of different benefits for the appraisal system. Um, there's some different techniques that your book mentions. Um, there's one where we look at, um, it, it um, looks at attributes, behaviors, um, and results. And those are kind of three different things. Um, the attributes, of course, is an approach to performance appraisal that looks at the characteristics of the individual and then the behaviors is an approach that looks at um, what they do, the actual behaviors that the person, the employee does, and then the results, what sort of results do they get? Um, and there's different, there, you know, it focuses on the attainment of the objectives and measurable results. And so there's different jobs where different types of appraisal systems would be necessary. Um, there's graphic rating scales. These are um, kind of, these are widely used. We've all seen these, you know, a five is outstanding and a one is unsatisfactory. Um, they are really, um, those are kind of, again, kind of subjective. Um, they, they may differ in the degree to which the meaning of the response categories is defined. How do you define outstanding? How do you Define unsatisfactory, and so you you have to. Those are a little bit. Um, those are a little bit squirrely, if, if you ask me. They don't really tell me anything as an employee. I guess let me put it that way. Um, there's the critical incident method. Um, this requires that written records be maintained of highly favorable and highly unfavorable performance. Again, this is an annual task. There's the ranking appraisal systems, and I won't let you read uh, a lot of these. What happens here is that um, the supervisor places all employees in a ranked order of overall performance. And so, it, it, so what you're doing is comparing employees against each other and not against their standards. And you may have the guy at the bottom. How, how much difference is between you know, number one and number five? Um, they may be closely aligned, but yet last is still last. Um, you may have how, you know, or you may have these that are up here and the last one is totally unsatisfactory. So um, they don't, that's kind of a, a different type of um, an arrangement that, that, again, very subjective. Behaviorally anchored rating scales uh, is in your book as well, where the various performance levels are shown on a scale. 
and described in terms of the employee's specific job behavior. Again, this, this is one that looks at behaviors and not traits or characteristics. Um, management by objectives is one that we have seen, we've seen a lot of that. It's kind of a buzzword uh, many years ago. Uh, and this features an agreement between the supervisor the, um, and the employee on the objectives that they want to meet during this particular period of time. Um, and, and the rating is on how well those objectives were uh, achieved. So um, it, gives, it get, takes some of the subjectivity out of it, and it's a mutual agreement on the part of the employee and the employer. Um, there's a, it's a four-step process where you review the job, and you do this job review, and then you have an agreement, the performance standards, objective setting, and then performance discussion. So um, again, man management by objectives is a way to uh, evaluate employees and appraise their, their work. And then total quality management, this uh, is a major focus of performance appraisals um, to provide employees with feedback in areas where they can improve. Um, it is on it, the focus of total quality management is on teams and groups of people achieving results as opposed to the individual. Now, of course, again, like always, there's some drawbacks to that as well. Um, but uh, this might be something that may be a little better suited for fire and emergency services. Um, certainly, we want to think about that is something that we want to think about with um, total quality management. Um, it's it's going to depend, the type of um, system used is going to depend on uh, the circumstances of the job within the fire department uh, and what the results are. And the author states his opinion by saying it's best to combine some of the techniques. You know, you can have somebody that when we look at attributes, behaviors, and results, you could have somebody that has really great results, but they're attributes or their attitudes and behaviors are really crummy. They, they achieve the same result, but they don't do it in the right way, the way they were taught. Or you could have somebody that does everything by the book, has great results, but yet their attitude or their attributes, uh, they have no bedside manner with patients. They have no customer service type of uh, personality. So a combination of those things, as we know, is really going to be the best for the job that we are looking at. Um, there's some, some errors, uh, and these should, should not be new. These have been around for a while. When we talk about appraisal errors, um, some of the ones that, that, that the overall system, when we look at some of these things, they have to be rated on observable dimensions of their performance rather on traits. So again, looking at both those things, rating criteria are clearly defined. Uh, rating scales are clearly defined and are job related. Um, of course, people are people. Supervisors are people. They're not robots. And and this is where that supervisory training will come into play as, as a great importance. Um, some of the, of the uh, errors, the halo and horn effect, um, you know, this is where you're seen as a good or bad person by your supervisor, which creates just a judgmental effect on your overall work performance uh, and, and all aspects of the job. Um, maybe they don't, I'm trying to think of an example here, but it's, you know, they look at one aspect of the job and um, rate you poorly on all of that because of that halo or rate you highly because of all of them, because they really like you. Um, central tendency, everybody kind of gets rated the same. You know, nobody's um, step, willing to step out on the limb and say you're really outstanding or really unsatisfactory. Um, there's everybody's in the middle. And so the way it takes some of um, the raider um, can avoid that controversy or extra work. Um, I know there was, I was thinking, when I was reading this, there was something I used to have to do when I taught at West Georgia Tech. You had to give. I can't remember what they called it, but it was like an, with an online class of kind of class attendance grade. And if you gave everybody fives, you had to justify it. Well, of course you didn't do that. You gave everybody threes because that was average and you didn't have to do any extra paperwork. So I probably shouldn't tell you all that, but it didn't affect your grade. Um, leniency or severity area, error, error, sorry, leniency or severity 
error. And this is where uh, in a supervisor rates everybody higher or lower than they should. Um, it may be that the supervisor is particularly strict or very lenient. Maybe they don't really care. Maybe some of the standards are unrealistic. Maybe the standards are too easy or they're too hard. Contrast effects, this is where an employee, employer compares uh, employees to each other. Again, that was that rating system that we went through that we discussed a minute ago. Um, and that, again, you should be rated against the standards that, for your job. Sampling error, this occurs when the employee's work is largely out of the uh, supervisor's view. Do you really know what your employees are doing? Um, do you really know how they perform? Have you gone out of your way when, when their work is away from you? I always wondered uh, when I did fire and life safety education, nobody was ever really there. That was my supervisor to watch how I did or how I interacted or to grade me on those things. So they didn't really know what I was doing. They thought I was doing a really great job. And I was, but you just, you know, um, how do you know? How do you know? Recency error, this is one I think that's most common. We know when our evaluations are, and so everybody kind of, uh, you know, starts to toe the line. Those that are late are always on time now. Uh, we maybe suck up a little bit to the boss. We start doing, we look back at our goals from the last time and start to work on those, uh, and that's what the supervisor sees. It's got to be based on the whole performance period, um, the whole year if that's what it is, instead of just those, those that recency, the things you do recently. Um, frame of reference error is another that's mentioned here. Uh, and this is where the supervisor compares an employee's performance to the rater's own personal standards for the job. Um, I'll quote a famous fire chief by saying, now when I was the fire marshal. And so I think sometimes we... Um, um, we think about that, we, how we would do the job, and if somebody doesn't meet that standard, instead of what the standard for the job is. And then, of course, just simple personal bias. And this is where you run the error of um, discriminatory practices. You know, you're biased against an individual or a culture or um, race, religion, gender, disability, or age. And um, we, we rate people um, poorly or maybe uh, better based upon um, that, that bias. So um, in, on page 213, there is a top, there's a chart that kind of um, summarizes that for you of those different biases, um, but they're all present. And you know, it's really hard because um, we're people to get past some of those biases but it's how we are trained and how we use that training to do performance evaluations that will help us decrease our biases and the errors that uh, come from um, being human when we're doing evaluations. Um, some of the things, and again, I'm not going to read this um, all the way through for you, uh, but the book references some of the elements of the uh, performance appraisal system. Of course, there has to be some kind of criteria. And this goes back again to that job task analysis. What is it I'm supposed to be doing? And how can I do that? What What is my job? And um, many times that's played out in the job description. But um, to make that measurable and specific, valid and reliable, we really have to look at those things to make sure that they are going to be able to be measured objectively. Or how can we measure those things objectively? National standards, firefighter certification systems can be used. Again, that helps with that validity and reliability. Um, there's got to be some kind of training for evaluators. I, if it is not mandatory, I would encourage each of you to attend a course uh, that perhaps your jurisdiction offers on uh, the evaluation process. Um, people be, magically become supervisors and they're supposed to magically know how to evaluate. So attend that training on how to evaluate performance, how to avoid those appraisal errors. And then there should be some sort of meeting, whether it's when the employee comes to work or subsequent to that. But within, uh, there needs to be some time where there's some expectations set. And this, again, helps to 
um, to set that bar for the employee, the level of performance that's expected um, to be met or exceeded, and, and it gives that clear understanding. Again, there needs to be some kind of documentation for that. Um, so make sure that you write that down or there's a document that you give employees. What is expected of them? Um, there needs to be ongoing feedback. Like I said, you should not, uh, as a manager or supervisor, you should be evaluating and appraising your employees. And I'm not going to say every day, but, you know, they should get constant feedback. What are they doing? Especially for that new employee or that employee that's moved into a new position. Um, Self-assessment. I think that that's an important piece that employees should conduct a self-assessment of themselves. <laughs> that's what self-assessment means, but um, they should be required to do that. It gets them thinking, how have I done? And it's often said that many times people rate themselves lower than, um, than what their supervisor would, but it also, it gives them a chance to um, Prepare for that meeting with their supervisor and to be more active as they reflect on their performance in the last year or performance period. Um, there should be some sort of midway feedback session. Again, um, we used to do, I think it was when I was with, with LaGrange Fire Department, we had quarterly um, informal evaluation. They weren't really evaluated, maybe they were just very informal, but they required you to do them quarterly. Uh, where you sat down and talked about performance. And I think there's value in that. And then there is the performance review. This is where the supervisor and the employee discuss their the employee's performance during the entire period. Um, and then um, the employee gets an overall rating of some kind. And at that meeting as well, there should be more goals set. If goals were not reached, why not? Were they, um, uh, were they too lofty? Were they, um, you know, have has the situation changed in the department? Maybe the department's focus has changed or the employee's focus has changed or something. So um, set some more goals at that, uh, at that, at that meeting. Um, your book references something when it talks about preparing for the performance meeting that I think is really great. Um, page 217 is a performance log. And 218 is an example of a T account, which, um, you know, what they did well and what they did poorly throughout the year or how they messed up. Now, one of the things that, that about the, the uh, about this, I think, is that, you know, if you've ever made that chart of, um, you know, where you draw it on the page, you're trying to make a decision. And so you've got the pros and the cons on the page. Well, to me, that's what this is. And, and it doesn't weight those things. Um, it, it assumes everything has an equal weight. So if you have more on the pros and less on the cons, you should do it. Uh, but I think that there's weighted values in each of those. And if I look at this, um, you know, look at the T account on page 218 um, on the, the, uh, the plus side, got start, you know, he rescued a child or this individual rescued a child. That, that's heavy weight to me. Also, in with my background, he did a good job in conducting a fire safety talk at the elementary school. That's heavyweight too. But on the the downside of that, um, you know, did not check the apparatus. Is that an equal weight with involved in an accident, a vehicle accident? So that was his fault, apparently. Um, so uh, you have to kind of weight some of those things, I think. And again, that goes back to that subjectivity. So. The performance log is basically just a, a, a document that helps you collect information. And I believe that this should be open to the employee. Many times it may put employees on the defensive, especially if you've only noted the bad things. Many times as supervisors, we're really quick to tell people when they do wrong, but we're not so quick to tell people when they do right. And uh, we should be just as quick to do that. I, I think that that is a human flaw in many, many situations, not just in uh, the fire department. So um, it talks about preparing for the uh, performance review meeting. Uh, many times, you know, it's like, come on in here, we'll do this. And, um, I, and it even references it in the book somewhere here. Here's your review. Just read it. Uh, it's cited. It, if, let me know if you have any questions. Well, 
well, that's not really what it's all about. Um, that's the easy way. Uh, and a lot of times I think we started doing that when there were no longer raises connected to that performance evaluation, you know, or um, I know in LaGrange we had the sliding scale of raises. And so you wanted to get that really high rating so you could get the highest raise possible. So um, it should be more than just, hey, read this. It should be a discussion. Uh, it, and, and the employee should be able to voice their feedback. Many times people are not going to write on that form. But they may tell you things, you know, it may be that this employee's performance is poor because they've been, they have a sick parent that they've been caring for that nobody knew about. Um, so, you know, I, I tend to look at things that way a little bit and give people the benefit of the doubt. Uh, maybe you need an agenda for your performance evaluation meeting um, just so you don't forget anything or let time get away and you forget to do the, the relevant steps. Um don't be so entrenched in your opinions that you can't see their side of it. Um, and certainly, again, this is where that self-assessment can come into play and have them bring it um, to their to that meeting. Um, it and it should be when when you conduct this this is this assessment this appraisal, uh, you want to make sure that you're prepared that you focus on actual performance um, that's job related. Um, Make sure that you're specific and provide examples. And I think that's an important piece. If you tell me that I'm not, you're not doing your job. Well, that doesn't tell me anything. Um, let me know, what am I doing? What am I supposed to be doing that I'm not doing? Or what is it I'm doing that I'm not supposed to be doing? How can I improve? How can I make it better? Um, what are some of those actions for uh, improvement? So, um, it should be a meeting. It should be free of, you should have this set aside on your calendar, not just to, as you're walking down the hall, hey, come here a minute, let me do this. Um, you should be in the right frame of mind and your employees should be in the right frame of mind as well. Um, discuss the past, but focus on the future. I think that's a very valid. And always end on a positive note. Um, I think that that's, uh, again, um, that's a pitfall sometimes that we don't do that. We're so quick to tell people what they do wrong. But end it on a positive note of some of some kind. Uh, hopefully that you can find one. Um, so pitfalls from that performance evaluation, you dominate the conversation, you lecture the employee, you're overly negative. You need to, even though you may have this T chart, it's got more negatives than positives, you, you want to try to balance those out. Uh, if you only focus on one aspect of performance, maybe, you know, if you think about the attributes, the behaviors, and, and the results, um, if you only focus on one of those, then, um, you know, if somebody's behavior is right on point, but um, they're getting poor results, um, then you need to focus on all of those things. Don't compare the, that employee with other employees. Nothing makes that employee feel any worse. Well, you should be like so-and-so over here. I don't want to be like so-and-so. I want to be like me. And I want to do my job. And I want, here's the paper that says, this is what I'm supposed to do as an employee. And that's what I want to be evaluated against. So don't compare um, to other people. Um, but also, try to don't try to force agreement. You know, many times people don't want to see their faults and they may have to think about it a little bit. Well, we schedule, schedule a follow-up meeting, but don't try to, to make them say, make them agree with you if they don't see it um, because it's not going to, it's not going to be successful for you. Um, a tool that has been, um, oh, and just to mention on page 221 in your book, there's a performance review meeting suggestions again. Uh, some of those I just mentioned, but you may want to look at that. 360 degree feedback. This is used for a lot of officers. Uh, you can use it for subordinates, uh, chiefs, deputy chiefs. Uh, I think it's a useful tool for anyone uh, where you receive evaluation from all sides. Hence, 360 degree. Uh, from those above you, those below you, uh, your um, colleagues, you know, um, uh, at the same rank or in the same job. Um, I think there's great value in that as well. 
Um, with this 360 degree feedback, um, it, like I said, it, it, you receive performance review data from all over. And then the comments of the evaluators are summarized and then given back to the um, individual to be evaluated. Some of the advantages of this, um, all employees are participating. And you know, your, your bosses may think you're wonderful, but your coworkers think you're crap. Um, sorry, but just laying it out there. But, um, you know, if you look at it in another way, your, your boss is your leader. How do they know really what kind of leader you are? Um, your leadership ability is best judged by those you lead, uh, by the subordinates. So there's some great value in that. It can be peer-driven and changes that are peer-driven. I found that many times that those are the best changes or the best ways for change to take place is your um, your peers will either shut you up or move you out or move you on or spur you to do right or to do better. Um, it can certainly motivate people who undervalue themselves. That person that doesn't think they're doing a good job or they're a poor leader, when they get a 360 evaluation that's really positive, um, it ha can help them in a lot of ways. Of course, there's just as many disadvantages and it's time consuming and it's costly. Uh, to do all of that, um, if if you have too many appraisers, sometimes the results can be difficult to interpret. Um, think about those appraiser biases um, that can just as easily fall into a 360 degree evaluation. Um, it can be destructive if you don't handle it right. You know, if if your employees don't like you and they want to get rid of you, um, they can can really turn the tables uh, in a big way. Uh, it can also create an environment of suspicion or a hostile environment. So um, you have to be careful with the 360, but I do think there's value. I do think there's value in it uh, in, in some ways. Now, when we look at um, the legal implications of performance appraisals, if you are going to fire someone, um, this is where they really come into play. Um, based, you know, if you're just giving people that Sunday school what I would call the Sunday school uh, appraisal, and then you want to fire them, um, you may not be successful. Your book says that employees won 64% of the wrongful termination suits decided by a jury trial. And the average award in these cases was $733,000. So um, appraisals have to be fair, objective, valid, and meet the legal requirements. Um, so some of those required elements, um, it, again, it's based on that job analysis. It goes back to that, that very beginning of that. Um, these values have to be, these, this job task has to be uh, incorporated into rating instruments. And that's where uh, using a standardized form for the entire organization, i.e. your jurisdiction, the county. Every county employee gets the same form. There may not be true value in that. Um, some um, supervisors have to be trained. That's another required element that will protect you uh, in, if, legal, um, if there's legal issues. A formal appeal mechanism. Again, evaluation and termination decisions are backed up with documentation of substandard performance. Again, if you don't do regular evaluations, um, whether it's, you know, verbal, written, um, if you don't do those continuously and you've given people that excellent evaluation, um, you're not likely to be very successful. Um, and, and you need to do some performance counseling has to be offered or, or provided uh, in order to assist those low performers. So um, there, some of the things you have to think about, it, it is, um, it's a legal document. Uh, and can be used uh, in, in many cases. So they should not be punitive. They should not be retaliatory. They should not be used to discriminate. The results should be fair, accurate, and su be supported by evidence and examples. And I think that's a real important piece right there, those examples. Beverly does a great job. Well, tell me how she does a great job. When did you see her do a great job? Um, I think that that is um, important. Uh, employees should have the opportunity to comment. Um, if they want to type up something and attach it, uh, that is certainly 
appropriate. They should have that opportunity. Um, appraisal results should not be used as the sole basis for promotions, terminations, or raises. So um, got to think about that too. Um, that performance appraiser needs to appraisal needs to provide timely feedback. Don't uh, both positive and negative. Okay, don't wait. Don't wait. Uh, I remember this keeps standing out in my mind. I don't even remember where I was working. But um, one of the employees had a performance appraisal and they told her she got a very poor performance appraisal. And one of the things on there was that she dressed poorly for the job. She had never been told that in the whole year that she worked there, you know, the, of this performance appraisal period. She'd never been told that she needed to step up her dress. And like I say, if this was uh, probably at a law firm where dress was important, but um that was a surprise to her, total surprise to her. And it should not have been. It should not have been. So um, things like that should not be a surprise. You should have counseling along the way. But also the good things that people do. Let them know that as well. So um, make sure that appraisal results are, are private and confidential as well. No one should know the results of another's uh, a performance appraisal. They're not discussed. Usually employees don't want to discuss those. They don't want to be the goody two-shoes if it's really good, but they also don't want to tell people that they're doing a bad job. So um, when we think about performance appraisals, remember the legal issues that are involved there. Um, they should be based on job requirements, job performance requirements, which is based on the job task analysis. They should be valid and reliable. They should not be discriminatory in any way. Um, we want to make sure that they are as objective as possible. And I think that this is where it's incumbent upon that manager or supervisor to think about performance appraisals the entire year. You know, we always dread that time. Oh, it's a form performance appraisal time again. I got to come up with something to say. If you are doing your job properly, I'm going to step out a little limb there. Um, you will have some documentation of good things and bad things. Uh, you will also, if there's a lot of bad things, you will have already counseled that employee and you will have documentation of that. Um, if there's really good, if there's a lot of good things, you will have documentation of where you shared that with that employee. So um, this is a huge part of the personnel process in um, emergency services. And I believe that Especially, you know, when you think about hiring and interviewing and those kinds of things that we've already talked about, HR has a big hand in that. With performance appraisals, this is this is you, the supervisor, the manager. Um, usually doesn't have a lot of input from HR about an individual employee. So it is incumbent upon you to, um, to have that information and not make it up or try to uh, wing it at the end, uh, but to take great pride and value in this opportunity to increase the value of that employee to the organization, as well as increase the value of the organization uh, in the community. So if you have any questions, let me know. Again, this is um, a little longer than I had thought it might be, but be sure to check out those things in your book, and I look forward to uh, another meeting just like this. Thanks. Bye. Oh. <laughs> All right.